thanks for the invitation. It's uh, good to talk to people. I, um, I haven't done so many online things this year and I mentioned a beg off teaching this term. So excuse me if halfway through, I just get exasperated with hearing my own voice rattle around my head uh, doing this and just walk away for a minute. But um, right, so let's get stuck into this. The, the title kind of says it all in terms of framing what I think uh, our intuitions are around how time works. And then we've been working from these basic idea that, okay, we'll just take the intuition at face value and see how far we can push it in terms of building models and, and, and validating those models. Um, the two things that I'm going to focus on today, the two pieces that I'm going to uh, work, uh, that I'm going to show you, the two pieces of work that I'm predominantly going to show you related to our modeling work of this time perception on this natural scale of kind of seconds up to all the data we're working with is around a minute, but in general, you know, seconds to minutes is, is the, the focus of this kind of work at the moment. There's this paper from a few years ago, um, which is the first thing we introduce. And then we've got this follow-up paper, uh, and these are closely interlinked, as you'll see. These, will, uh, these two papers um, will comprise kind of the first two thirds of what I'm gonna talk about. And the final third, I'm gonna talk about some very, very brand new very preliminary data that we've only, um, some work that we've been doing very recently and the stuff I'm gonna show you is, you know, days, days old, it's fresh. So that's very exciting. Hopefully I don't run over time with my excitement about showing these new results, but that's kind of the overview here. So we just start off with this idea, I think, or at least this is where we started. The time experience is contextual, right? I don't think this is very controversial. Um, our experience of how long something is, the extent of time uh, for a given experience, it depends very, very heavily on what that experience is. So, you know, when you're waiting at a bus stop, it's very different than when you're on a beach vacation, it's very different than when you're in the dentist. And I think this is intuitive to everyone. And so just starting from this idea, perhaps we can break this down into simple features like, well, it's obviously somewhat related to perceptual content. Um, and we've known for quite a while, back in kind of the early cognitive psychology period, back in the, the 60s and 70s in particular, there was a, there was a great deal of research uh, on this topic, on the, potent, the, the potential contribution of, of specific content and the complexity of that content in terms of very simple designs and how it, it relates to time perception. So, there's this quite uh, influential in some circles book by Onstein that describes a, a very long series of experiments that he did uh, in a summer internship. Um, and at the time, uh, Block was doing some, some similar things following up on this before he kind of started to take a strong position against it. Um, these kinds of experiments would often be sometimes as simple as things like a, a sequence of flashing lights. So you'd have a complex sequence or a simple sequence or you know, ascending and descending tones, this kind of thing. But a lot of the time they might be more related to kind of more classic cognitive psychology type paradigms. So that you might have, uh, you might be given a task where you have a, a set of cards and you're asked to sort those cards into um, you know, black and red or um, sort them into numbers in some, some complex order. And in general, what people found was if you had a very simplified task and a very simple stimulus set um, that you would end up underestimating time relative to, to a case where you'd have a more complex task or a more complex stimulus set, a more complex stimulus pattern. Um, there's this quite, I like this paper a lot. It, it does several, there's a series of experiments that tries several different ways of, of operationalizing change in terms of in a sequence and how that might influence um, your perception of time. And you, you know, there's a figure from that paper, it's quite simple. In, in general, the idea of course here is that the perceived duration is dependent on the complexity of the stimulus. So as you make more and more complex sequences that people are shown, that they will, they will usually increase their estimate of time. So for a given physical clock duration, that their subjective duration will become prolonged the more complex the sequence is. So this has been known for a while in, in various circles and in various demonstrations. And, I think it's a pretty reasonable intuition to start from. The, the time perception field kind of went away from these, these works and challenged them a lot through particularly the 80s and early 90s um, for reasons that I don't find all that compelling. So I'm not even going to go into them today. But what I, I, I think that 
just going back to these, to me, quite clear and powerful intuitions that map very well onto uh, my natural experience of the world, these experiments seem to do a pretty good job of that. So I was happy to go back and let's start with these intuitions. Time perception is related to perceptual change, uh, the content. So if you can just figure out some way to kind of track perceptual change in a, in a meaningful way, that maybe this is all you really need to get pretty close to being able to model how people do time perception. And I'd just like to note that specifically here, I'm referring to perception, not necessarily stimulus, right? So a big focus going back into these early studies that I was just referring to is a lot of the time the focus there was on taking for granted that the complexity of the stimulus is presented is almost directly what happens uh, internally, that the, the complexity of the stimulus would scale with what the complexity of change is that you've presented in your stimulation. You know, so as an experiment or from an experimenter point of view, um, when of course it's going to depend very heavily on the state of the person doing the observing. Um, and I'd like to, to just make that tweak here and that then justifies or motivates us to go in the direction that we go. So if you have this problem you're presented with, which is the problem we were presented with a, a few years ago now, this idea of how you might um, want to measure what perceptual change is. Where are you gonna measure perceptual changes? What would this possibly mean in terms of a fully formed organism with all these different modalities and all these different processes and very complex things going on? How might you deal with that? How might you break that into something you can work with? And at the time we got very excited, uh, this is going back five or uh, six, seven years even, um, when we first started talking about this, was this idea that at that time was relatively new, uh, just a few years old, were these powerful, deep convolutional neural nets that were being used for image classification. And so the function of these kind of artificial neural networks, these classification networks, is to classify images into the appropriate high-level label. So you, you input pixel-wise an image of a dog, and then you're able to produce the category labeled dog. Okay, and so the purpose here, the sole purpose of these networks is to classify images. What was really interesting at the time um, was people were starting to use techniques that could break down how these image classification networks were processing the information to some degree. And you would find that the, the particular nodes would be selectively responsive to particular types of image features. And the arrangement was broadly something like what we know to be quite similar to, for example, primate ventral vision. So at very low layers that the features that might be selective are these kind of ball wavelets, and then you get kind of textures, complex compound textures, and then proto objects and objects. And this kind of, at least to some degree, mimic some features of uh, what we know about biological vision in terms of its hierarchical arrangement and uh, selective responsivity to uh, different image features and complexity of image features as you go through the hierarchy. So the idea then is, well, maybe this is a reasonable place to start. Is this the same thing as saying that either these convolutional neural nets, the fact that they have some of these shared features, is this the same thing as saying that they somehow perfectly capture ventral vision in primates I, I would say categorically, no, that's not what I intend to say. And there's uh, quite an extensive literature now uh, that addresses potential similarities and, and whether those similarities are powerful and the degree to which they're useful. And I, I would encourage people to look into that. It's very interesting and an evolving conversation. Um, there's the other side of this, of course, of this conversation is, well, what things are missing? And there's also uh, a, a, an emerging literature on that. This brain score paper is quite interesting. That you know, you try and classify, you, you try and categorize these different image classification networks or different neural networks that are for object recognition in terms of both their biological similarity and how well they work. And so you can come up with these kind of composite scores. Is it a good network? And how much is it reasonably like uh, biological vision? You know, does these conversations about whether you need to have recurrent components or, or if it's simply feed forward. These are all reasonable conversations, but I think they're kind of all a little bit beside the point because for the purpose of if we're just gonna say, well, we need to make a model and we're gonna make a model based on networks that seem to exhibit some features of uh, biological vision. We only really need those models to contain sufficient relevant features for the task that we're applying it to. 
So if you can find a model like that, and let's just take for granted that these convolutional neural nets are doing a good enough job, and as we've seen, they contain some relevant features, then what we might be able to do is just take for granted all the hard work of how visual classification works by just using this model, and then build whatever cognitive architecture on top that we require to get back things like time. So these kind of second order properties that we need, um, these higher order cognitive properties that we want to investigate, we can just ignore some of the lower level perceptual processing and basic machinery to some degree. The bonus of doing this kind of thing on this scale with these kinds of networks is that unlike uh, kind of classic cognitive models, we don't have to be constrained in the kinds of uh, stimuli that we can use. We can use quite natural or naturalistic stimuli. We can use videos where we, you know, previously with models that these simple cognitive models, we might, might be limited to just showing specific input sequences in terms of pulses. So it's really neat. And then I guess the point that you end up with there is if the model works to whatever degree, then you, you have a, a starting point at the very least that you can extend into with more and more biologically reasonable networks as they, as they become available, as people get better at building these kinds of networks, you can extend your work in that way. So I thought this was a very interesting place to start and might be a pretty good way to make substantial progress. I just wanted to briefly duck out in another digression and just uh, plug this paper, which I found very interesting when it came out. Um, it addressed this idea of, of what I'd been getting at with our work, which is this idea of taking a, a, a network that's for something like a deep convolutional neural network that's for image classification and building cognitive processes on top of it. There's lots of work that's about making deep neural network models that are to do some tasks. So, you know, the simplest version being the ones we just talked about, like image classification. And of course, we've got this long history of building these cognitive models. This paper does a nice job of trying to make a case for the combination of these in, in the same way that I'm trying to suggest here, that if we can get rid of some of the offload some of the hard work into these models and take some of its performance for granted that we can start to build these models that maybe are able to do quite relatively complex tasks or mimic relatively complex features of the world um, without too much difficulty. Whereas with uh, traditional cognitive models, we might be a bit stuck. So I think that's a very interesting observation in this paper just because it mimics my thoughts, which is pretty narcissistic. But moving on, We've got this network, we think it's a pretty reasonable thing, so let's go see how well it works. How we turned this deep convolutional network that was doing image classification into a time model, very simply, we have the, the network, we input some image, and then as, as I've shown you, so the, the different ways of the network are, are sensitive to different complexity, different types of features, going from really basic features up to very complex features. We can input videos, and if you input a video as a sequence of frames, then of course we can just look at the, the pattern of activation that's induced in the network, how the network responds to the image at any given time step. So at this time step, we've got this cow just starting to enter frame, and then in the next time step, the, the cow's fully in the frame. So this induces a different pattern. If we can just figure out what the difference between patterns is, then this starts to be a metric of, of the evolving change in the network in response to stimulation. We just used a simple metric here. At each layer that we considered, we, we took the Euclidean distance or some Euclidean distance across the, the nodes in the network. So we'd end up with these kind of arbitrary unit distances, um, right? And so this is just, okay, well, the difference between here and here is this number. The difference between here and here is this number. So now that we have these numbers, these somehow indicate the amount of difference between successive frames in, in a video, so between successive time points. We just need to then decide which of these uh, distances, what level of difference is something that we care about. So the black line here is we're moving across the x-axis. The x-axis here is moving through time, time steps, and the y-axis is, is our distance. So each, the black line here is, is showing the, the difference as you move through these frames of the video at each of the four layers that we're considering in this particular model. So all you need to do now is figure out which of these little spikes are the ones that you want to pay attention to, which of these are salient events, which of these changes, which of these differences between successive time points are things that we would say are important to, to keep track of. So if you look at the top layer here, you can see there's this kind of, you know, lots of these small changes that maybe aren't very relevant, and then these larger spikes. So maybe what, what we want to do is just come up with a simple way to capture um, these 
these larger spikes. And in this case, with this very simple model here, we just had this little decaying threshold. So every time that the threshold found an event, it would reset to a maximum and then it would slowly decay uh, corrupted by Gaussian noise. It would just take a bit of a walk and then eventually it would find another event, reset and go on. So now we'd say, well, this is a salient event that we've detected. This is a salient event that we've detected. And this is a salient event that we've detected. Um, and so we do this at each of these levels. Now that we've got this at each level throughout this epoch, throughout this period of time, we can just accumulate each of these uh, salient events. So we just literally, it's a bucket. This is a very basic model. We've just got this bucket of memory that's adding up all the salient events in an epoch. And then it's just a regression task to turn this back into seconds. So we would say that this somehow represents your implicit sense of time, but humans are able to respond in seconds. We've learned to label them. So regressing uh, this basic experience into these, these standard units is something that we've learned to do and that we're able to do. It's just a regression problem. So we just solve it with a simple regression model. Okay, so again, to reemphasize, this is kind of what we consider to be our sense of time built out of these salient events, salient events because there's lots of you know, stuff going on here, but we're gonna consider that only the relatively extreme or the relatively larger changes, the ones that you wanna track. So having built this model this way, we then wanted to go and check how well it worked. And so what we did was we had, I had an intern go out around Brighton and around the campus here and just record uh, six hours of first person video with a GoPro camera. So this is one of the stimuli from the experiment that we would run and that we would show to the model. So this is just a video of her walking at a cow and then she'll walk away in a second. That's about it. So she's just walking around in the, uh, in the area around campus. Hopefully that wasn't too glitchy, moved okay. We had all these different uh, first person kind of videos that were recorded around town, around campus, or in the, like actually in the city center with buses coming past, sitting in a quiet cafe on campus, walking around campus in an office, walking around outside campus. So there's lots of cases where there's kind of lots of movement going on, but not much actually in the scene. So on this, you know, walking around campus, there's not much going on, right? Um, there's an, occasionally a person walking into frame, it's just kind of leafy trees. Walking around the city, of course, there's cars coming past, there's people on the pavement, you're going past, it's very busy, there's lots of stuff happening. But overall, it, across this kind of set of videos, we have then this kind of cross-section of, of stimuli in terms of how much stuff's happening in them, what kind of scene it is. So we've got this kind of naturalistic spread of what we're trying to uh, encompass. We got uh, 55 people to sit down and do an hour of, of ratings of just reporting how long videos were. So we just showed them up to 80 videos that were up to a minute each. So they were between one second and, and 64 seconds. And each person just watched the video and then reported on a visual analog scale how long in seconds uh, they thought the video was. Here's just the basic human data. So on the x-axis, we have the physical time, the real duration of the video that we showed. This is aggregated across all participants. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the estimation that they gave. So the, this is, of course, the dotted, the dashed line here is, is vertical perception. This is pretty standard looking human data for a time perception task. People generally are uh, overestimating the shortest durations and underestimating the longest durations, which in the time field is referred to as Virot's law, but it's just an expression of regression to the mean um, that we see in lots of these kinds of tasks. It's a bit messy around the bottom here, but you can see the, the variance around the estimates is roughly proportional to the intensity. It's a bit messy at the bottom. Um, and this is, this is generally in accordance with the scalar property of time that they refer to in, in the time field or Weber's law, basically. Okay, so we've got these, all these different scenes. This is the overall reports, just aggregating them uh, regardless of scene. We can look at the effect of different scene types. So the, the y-axis here is basically this normalized bias, right? So that we can aggregate across the different duration of trial. Um, and what we find basically, so zero would be if people were unbiased uh, by the different scene types. So if we just kind of pool the data across people into these different broad scene types, so city scenes where there's lots of stuff changing, sitting around in a quiet office or a cafe where there's not really much stuff changing or walking around campus where stuff's changing, but a bit more slowly. Um, there's this bias, there's this tendency that people tend to overestimate um, the city scenes relative to the other scenes and underestimate the office and cafe scenes relative to the other scenes. Okay, and of course, this kind of, I think, matches with the intuitions we might have about these natural scenes, that people will generally 
when more stuff's happening, when you're in a busier scene and there's lots of stuff going on, that you will tend to think that it's longer. Um, so this is a kind of simplified experimental reduction of our, uh, of what I think is a reasonable starting point about our intuitions. Okay, whoops, that's not good. What's going on? <laughs> um, that was just to show the, the model again, and I don't know what's happening. Um, so now that we've got our model and we've got our data, we would just show the same videos, the exact same video set that we um, had shown to our human participants, we showed to our model frame by frame. Full frame model here refers to the fact that the input that we were giving to the model was the entire, well, most of the frame of the video. So the, 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 the kind of full frame, you know? Uh, so it wasn't just specified on, on some particular location. It was basically showing the whole video. So the network was being given the entire video and then using that information to classify. When we use that model, as I showed you earlier, we can see that it produces some pretty reasonable estimates. So, you know, firstly, as the physical time that we, that we input the video increases, the estimate provided by the model increases as well. It seems to be overestimating short durations and underestimating long ones, uh, quite similarly to what humans do. And again, there's a bit of a uh, deviation from it here, but overall the variance is roughly proportional to the intensity. So it's roughly following Weber's law. So it seems to be doing something quite similar. It seems to be exaggerated relative to the humans, especially at these shorter durations, but it seems to be doing a pretty good job. So, you know, our basic model framework is pretty reasonable. There is an important point about this though, I think that when we're walking around the world, you know, we're using the input here of the whole frame, the whole video frame to the model. But when humans are walking around the world, we aren't able to, I don't know, pay attention. We don't, we don't tend to pay attention or be aware of the entirety of our visual field, this huge amount. We tend to look at a relatively small patch uh, around kind of paraphobial size, this, this patch where we have um, the highest resolution in terms, of, in terms of our receptors, right? So what we could do, because in this experiment, we had our human participants uh, doing these estimates of time, we were also tracking eye tracking data. So we, we knew where they were looking. So here's an, here's an example of a trial that was shown to a participant. And the red box here is a, is a bounded box that's centered on where that person's gaze was for that given trial. So you can see, you know, they're not looking over in the distance at grass pointlessly. They're focusing on objects that they're going to interact with. This is, I think, pretty typical, right? And what you would expect, a human's going to look at stuff that is kind of in the near field and they're going to interact with generally. So we had this information, we had, the, we had this knowledge of, of the fact that humans weren't, of course, looking randomly. They're looking at very specific parts of the scene. So we use this information and un uh, unlike the first version of the model where we had the entire frame as input, in, in a second version of the model, we just used this input uh, bounded by this box that was centered on fixation. We call this the gaze model. When we built this gaze model, we found that it performed much better than the full frame model. So it was, it was still overestimating uh, short durations and underestimating longer durations, but it had this nice kind of variance proportional to the mean. And most importantly, if we compared the error, so the blue dashed line here, is the human data. If we compared the error in the models versus the human data, you can see the red line here is the gaze model. It's doing quite well. And I think this is really interesting from the perspective of what you think humans are doing, at least when you ask them to do time perception. And when you constrain the model to do this similar, that humans, when you ask them to do time perception, and perhaps when you ask them to do many things, are looking for where there is relevant information in the scene and the relevant information in the scene to time might be specific to, to some particular feature. But whatever it is, when you use the human gaze, when they were given the same task, you can make the model perform much better. So when you constrain the input to the model to be more like the input that the humans kind of were focusing on, the model becomes more like them. I think that's really interesting and perhaps reveals a little bit about what humans are doing in general, but particularly when, when asked to consider time. Okay, so we had our human data here that had this uh, scene-wise bias. We can also look at that for our model and you can see, even though it's very exaggerated, the model is pr roughly producing the same pattern. Um, this model wasn't tuned to reproduce human reports. It was trained to reproduce veridical duration. It was trained on physical durations. 
So you took the, the events that it could find and then you regressed them against physical duration. And out of the box, it produces this pattern. It's massively overestimating uh, the city scenes. Uh, but again, this is, you know, it's not been tuned in any particular way to reduce that. It doesn't have any knowledge of, of the world in general. And it is subject to the biases of the stimulus set that we that we presented to it. It has no information outside of the stimuli that we're presenting it. So I think that's really interesting that the gaze model uh, can just naturally reproduce this pattern of biases. Okay, so to sum up that section really quick, um, our model that's based on this convolutional neural network seems to work pretty well. It produces human-like estimates that have all these common features of human-like estimation for time. The estimates are biased by natural stimuli in a pattern that's quite similar, just out of the box, the model behaves that way. But you could, of course, you know, we covered this a little bit before talking about the, the value of convolutional neural nets. You can, of course, criticize the biological plausibility. You know, this isn't a biological system. It's, it's this artificial neural network trained just to do image classification. So is it a reasonable model of how humans do it? Well, the obvious test of that then is, well, let's see if we apply this kind of similar algorithm, but in a biological network, if we can get similar answers. So that's this paper that's led by Maxine Sherman. All the work that I'm gonna present in this section is, is work that Maxine's been responsible for and has been the lead on. And this paper is on BioArchive, so you can have a look if you like. The basic premise here was that in our, in our first model, we were taking the, the video itself and then constraining it with our gaze uh, contingency and using that as the input to the model and seeing what the model would then figure out about time. What we did instead in this experiment was we had our participants in a scanner, an MRI scanner, and we had them watch these videos and then make behavioral reports. So, uh, you know, the entire time is in the scanner, showing them these silent videos. Um, there was no sound, it was just visual. And we collected the, the neuroimaging whilst they watched the video. And then at the end of the video, they would make a, a report about how long each video was. The videos were between eight and 24 seconds here. So a bit longer than the shortest and a bit shorter than the longest from the previous thing. And rather than in uh, our previous work where I showed you that we were looking at the voxel, uh, sorry, the, the node-wise activation in our classification network, what we did here was we built these little models of um, a brain hierarchy, in this case, is showing a visual hierarchy moving from primary visual cortex down through ventral vision. And we, we specified these hierarchical layers, and then we looked at the voxel-wise changes, TR by TR. So what we would do is we just look at the bold level within a, a given defined ROI, and then we would look at how much it changed from moment to moment, from uh, pass to pass in the scanner. So we would then be able to convert the, the voxel-wise activity into units of change in the same way as we did for our, for our artificial network model, but based on uh, bold here. We do a similar kind of thing with our salient event detection. So, you know, each of these gray uh, and, and red dots represents, so the y-axis here again is, is the difference between each uh, successive time point. And the red line is our, is our criterion, is our threshold to define that that's a salient time point. There was a change there, the difference between the difference in the voxel pattern between one time point and the next is something that we would consider to be relatively large. And so we're going to keep track of that. We would accumulate those, and then we would have this set of, uh, of events. So the, the set of uh, accumulated salient events versus physical time. So that we could regress, we could build this little simple regression model that would regress um, the accumulated salient events back onto physical time. And then we could look at how that related to the human bias that we had from our, from our earlier uh, experiments, these, these different scene-wise biases and the, and the different biases trial-wise that humans would show. So this was all pre-registered. Um, so this is a pre-registered model-based fMRI study, which when we started this uh, project, I wasn't aware of another model uh, another pre-registered model-based fMRI study. Um, so we pre-registered all of the measures, the behavioral and the neuroimaging measures. We pre-registered how many trials, conditions, what the levels would be in terms of how long we would be showing people. We pre-registered uh, the trial and participant level exclusion criteria. And we pre-registered a series of specific hypotheses and how exactly they would be tested. For example, in, in a simple uh, behavioral, a simple test of the behavioral measure, we'll also run Bayesian t-test. 
um, with the prior being the standard deviation and so on. Uh, you know, and this, this number was taken from an estimate from our previous work. We period the parameters of all of our model-based fMRI analyses, which I hadn't seen anywhere at the time. Um, so we predefined exactly where we'd be looking, exactly what our ROIs would be, exactly how they'd be defined. Um, and we pre-registered the, the precise criteria parameters that we were going to use for the model. So everything that we started with, the core hypotheses that we wanted to do, the core model-based analyses we were going to do, these were all pre-registered based on what we thought should happen, um, as opposed to collecting the data and fishing around in parameter space until we found the correct set. So the trial sequence is very simple, just as before. So we just had people watch the video and then um, at the end of the video, they used visual analog scale to report. Here's the human behavior. So each of these lines is a different participant and it's the aggregate. There's nothing particularly uh, special going on here. There are some people who are particularly poor at doing this in the scanner, um, but overall the data is generally okay. What we're able to do um, as before, we were able to show that we get this scene-wise bias. This particular set of videos that we used in this experiment only contained the, the office and the city scenes, the kind of extreme ends. So of course we are time limited in, in using the scanner. So we're trying to maximize the behavioral difference that we could get. Um, but that replicates more or less the, the magnitude that we were finding in the, it's a slightly smaller magnitude, but the, the direction is, is roughly the same, sorry. I've got the, the, uh, I've got the figures flipped around in their direction. Uh, but so this is the office data and the city data from the, the first uh, experiment that I was showing earlier. And then you can see it replicates broadly this pattern. In this paper, we also wanted to run our model, our, our convolutional neural network based model, um, you know, just to verify, we've got this new set of videos that we're showing this particular new set of videos, let's just replicate uh, that we can do it again. So here's the data from, from running the same network I described before, but on this new video set, the same videos that we're gonna show these participants in the scanner. You can see it does a pretty good job again, it's underestimating these longer durations. It replicates this, this uh, scene bias. It produces a slightly larger bias um, than our human participants. You can see it's doing a reasonable job again. So there's not really a problem with that. That's the second time we've been able to make that one work. Um, so going back to our, our, our model that we're going to apply to our imaging data here, our voxel-wise differences. So this is our overall scheme, and we're now going to apply this model. I described that we did a ventral vision model. We also did two control models, because of course it's kind of trivial if you're looking at brain imaging data, that if you're going to accumulate changes, there's always going to be changes TR to TR in the imaging data that you're getting back, right? So you're going to accumulate and you're going to have time no matter what. So if we were able to show that we could reproduce uh, accumulating time, that would be quite trivial. So what we need to be able to do is in this particular experiment, we're showing people silent naturalistic videos. We would only expect based on our premise that the visual model, a model that's based only on the activation of visual areas, would reproduce the biases of our human participants. But making ones based on audition, the only audition they've got here is the, the scanner noise, which isn't going to be relevant to, uh, particularly relevant to their experience because they're watching this, this scene that's got rapid changes in it and so on. And somatosensory model, uh, where of course, you know, you're just laying in the scanner, not really doing anything. So for each of these models, so in each case, we just applied to the different ROIs, the model as I described earlier. And you can see for each case, we're able to reproduce estimates of time. It's not really a problem. So the model predicted duration on the y-axis and the, and the shown duration of the videos that we're uh, showing to our human participants. So these models that are based on just bold while people are watching the, the TR by TR changes in bold, we can reproduce estimates of time that are totally reasonable for all three models. So that is that we're reproducing estimates of, of physical time, not a problem. When we look at the biases that are reproduced by the model, only the visual-based bias, uh, only the visual-based model is reproducing the scene-wise bias that we see in our human participants' behavioral reports. The other two models aren't able to reproduce this scene-wise bias. We also looked then at the trial-by-trial -trial, uh, correlation. So we built a, a series of, um, for each model we built, uh, when you mixed effects models is what this is reporting. And so this is the beta that's associated with the um, time 
component, right? So what we're talking about here, this is demonstrated in terms of the human bias in quantiles. But what you can see overall is that what we're able to do is predict trial by trial what the human per, uh, responses were going to be and the bias in them for whatever the scene is. So this is based purely on bold. When we look at the, these are, this is showing a heat map of the different criterion parameters, so our threshold going back, if you remember, our threshold for where we declare salient events, our red line that's going through and decides whether something's a salient event or not. Um, we can look at the different parameter ranges. So we pre-registered specific parameter ranges. We can look at the, the range of parameters in which the model would basically work out uh, such that the model would still predict our human participants' responses. And you can see that for the visual-based model, there's a very broad range in which it would still do pretty well. So until you get to quite extreme values of the thresholds, it would still basically do a good job of predicting human behavior. Uh, whereas the other control models, there's not really uh, particularly any, any parts of the, of the parameter space where it does a good job. Right, so to sum this up, we could predict trial by trial human estimates of duration for naturalistic videos based on brain activity alone, brain activity recorded while they were watching these videos. The estimates from our control models applied in these other sensory domains um, were not able to predict the human estimates. They were able to produce reasonable estimates of time. In fact, the estimates of time correlated with physical time very well, but they didn't reproduce and they didn't replicate these biases, these subjective biases that people have in their, in their behavior reports, in their perception, we would say. I think that our conclusions, the fact that we we're able to build this model and make these predictions and get it to work such that we can predict trial by trial human reports of um, subjective duration. We we're able to do so in a fully pre-registered model-based analysis of, of imaging. I think that that's quite a powerful thing. We didn't just fish around post hoc until we found the correct set of results. This was all stuff that we predetermined. Um, and to just reiterate then, so we showed that this simple algorithm in, in a convolutional neural network worked pretty well at, re at broadly reproducing them. And then we showed that you, if you just take the same principles, but you apply them to this indirect measure of brain activity in bold, that you can come up with a pretty good estimation of what people subjective experience or what their subjective reports in any case are going to be about time for these quite naturalistic images that you're showing. So I think that's quite an interesting sequence of, of results so far, but it doesn't necessarily speak that strongly to this idea of accumulation of salient events, right? I've barely touched on this notion of events at all. So they're a critical part of our model, right? So these are our events and we're accumulating them here. Uh, and in, in this model, we've got our, our event designation here. But what is the actual role of these events? Why are we talking about events as this special category of thing? The work I'm going to talk about now is work that was done by Alberto Mariola, who's a PhD student that I'm working with um, on various things at the moment. Um, and this is brand new data that basically we're working on very presently. And Alberto, the stuff I'm going to show you is stuff that we've only kind of produced in the past week or so. So excuse me if, if I'm a bit stilted going through it as it's my first time to tell people about it. When we talk about events, what's really interesting is that events is a concept, you know, events through time is a concept that's well developed in many ways in the episodic memory literature. There's this event segmentation theory that's been promoted by Zacks for almost 20 years now. Um, and it's this basic idea that in continuous experience, the way that we're reducing or, or processing our continuous experience of our perceptual world and our imagery and everything into uh, components to be remembered is to segment them into kind of little bundles, right? So we build these event models that contain like, well, here's an event, and then there's stuff that I don't need to worry about, and that's kind of related to that event, and then there's a change, and I need to keep track of that. Um, so it's this idea that the event models are kind of breaking, parcelating our experience into smaller bits, and each of those kind of parcellations are kept. Um, so the idea broadly that, that Zach talks about a lot and he puts in a predictive coding or predictive processing kind of terminology broadly, it's the idea that each event, each event model represents a kind of stable state before you transition to something. So while you're in some place in, in your perceptual and sensory and uh, you, could, you could even say more broadly in your experience that you 
you're in a stable kind of state and then you transition to a new state and then to a new state and so on. And so this notion of event is quite similar to what we basically you know, worked towards when we're breaking down our, our naturalistic videos and how they're being processed to get out, out our model of time. And there's been quite substantial work, uh, not necessarily from the Zach's point of view, but concurrent to it, from people like Baldassano in instantiating this kind of thing within brain data. So you might take, in this case, fMRI data. And then what you'll be looking for is you've got this conceptual idea we were just talking about of stable states, but we're just looking in the imaging data for, okay, well, there's this stability, and then there's a transition, the stability, and there's a transition. And so each of these represents an event boundary. So they've been working in, and famously, Chris Balasano has a long series of papers on this now where, with different uh, imaging modalities they're using hidden Markov models to kind of understand these stable state transition kind of uh, scenarios and then try to map them to this idea of events in memory. And what they often do, and it's quite common to use these TV series, like lots of people use Sherlock. Um, there's several imaging data sets that, that use these kind of TV series. And then they try to build these models that uh, across cortical hierarchy, you're extracting events. And then as you go through, you can build up to kind of a higher complexity, these kind of multimodal, so events as defined across modalities. And you start to get more to your know, narrative type breakdown. So events that are defined by narrative and whoops, and that perhaps these, um, this information is then being fed into kind of hippocampal uh, processing in terms of classic understanding of where episodic memory is stored. And recently people have been talking all about time cells and this kind of thing. Um, but the idea would be that eventually these events as they're being collected in this context, find their way into memory systems. So it's very similar in its conception to where we've come from with time. So this becomes a very interesting thing that we're converging towards this kind of similar definition of events. There are other alternative approaches to this um, in terms of technique. Uh, so there's, there's this work by colleagues and colleagues where they, they're looking at similar kinds of things using different methodologies. Um, but the idea is still like, can you find the boundary in some imaging data, be it scalp EEG or in fMRI where you take the imaging data and you try to say, well, okay, well, here's a point in time where things are quite similar. Okay, well, now they've transitioned. And then the boundaries between these are, are event boundaries. So what we got very interested in is if this idea that on the surface of it looks to kind of map out that we've got these events from data-driven approaches coming from the episodic memory literature where they've got this notion of event segmentation. And we've got these events from our model-based approach to time. What are these events and are they the same thing? Conceptually, they look like they're, they're highly related, but it would be interesting to go ahead and actually check how related they really are. We had some data just sitting around from, a, from an experiment that I ran a few years ago. So this experiment was identical to the uh, time, the initial time experiment that I described to you. Same videos, same task, but uh, we had EEG and, and desktop eye tracking concurrently. Um, we only ended up with 13 participants for this particular thing, but we had the same design as everything else. So the, the data set up stimulation was all the same. We were just recording EEG and eye tracking. So we had this data sitting around for a different purpose. And we thought, okay, well, let's go in and we we'll use EEG data to do these kind of event segmentation approaches and see what happens. But before we can do that, because the, the task that we've used here was a time perception task, we didn't really have any idea of, of how people were segmenting it. And a common approach that people use in the event segmentation, which in the episodic memory field, they get people to manually annotate videos. So they get them to sit down and say, okay, well, there was a scene transition here, something changed here. And this then becomes your ground truth for when there's event or when there's an event. Um, so we set up this online experiment uh, where we showed people the same video sets that we'd used in the EEG experiment. So we could get this ground truth of where they thought changes were happening. Each participant watched 80 clips. We had 150 people uh, do it. So we ended up with all of these people trying to get an idea of where events were in these videos. So we could then go back with our different methods and compare what we got. The basic task here is a, is a video, hopefully it runs well enough. I'll just skip through this very quickly, but the idea very simply is you can see the setup here. You'd just be watching this video 
walking around and the participants task was just to press this button at the bottom when they thought that the scene had changed that's all so or that there was some important change in the scene so if in this case okay well you're walking up to this guy you've walked past this guy okay well you're now into a crowd perhaps that's a scene if a bus goes past perhaps that's that's a change in in scene the bike going past so that's a sudden change so we we ask people to kind of broadly interpret what the video content was and to break it into these kinds of events that we could then use as our ground truth. They were able to, at the end of the video, go back and review where they put their annotations and update them if they thought that they got them wrong or whatever. And then we, we used the annotations that they'd given us um, as our ground truth, as I said. Right. So we now have the videos, the same set of videos that we'd shown to our online participants. And they provided us with these manual annotations of where they thought there were events. We've got our EEG data that we're going to apply these methods that come from the, the episodic memory literature, more or less, in terms of finding where events might be based on the, the EEG data. And then we've got our deep net model, which is based on this hypothesis that I've explained to you already, this idea of how we, we think that people are doing time. So these are our kind of time-based events. These are our EEG-based um, events from a data-driven perspective. And these are our events when we just ask people to say where events are. And again, this is all in naturalistic videos. And so they all the all three methods are applied to the exact same video sets. Okay. So what we're going to try to do is say, well, how do these different approaches relate not only to each other, but how do the, the model-based events relate to our human? annotated events and how do our data-driven events relate to our human uh, annotated events, this being our ground truth. So we had to come up with a method to figure out how to do this. We've basically got these, these different raters, right? We've got our 150 participants. We've got all these different uh, raters who are saying where they think events are in a video. And then we've got our two other raters. We've got our data-driven EEG rater and our model-based rater. So what we came up with uh, as a way to do this is a very simple distance measure. So as you go across through time here, people might say that there's an event, right? So on the y-axis we have events and on the x-axis we have time. So you could see that this blue line here is someone, well, they said that there was an event at around you know, 1.8 seconds. And they said there's some more events and some more events. And the orange observer is, a, is another observer had a similar pattern, but a little bit different. So you could imagine that a very extreme difference here would be that a person who never reports events, they would just continue along at the bottom or that you know they might report few events. So the key part here is that the more that these things diverge, the larger the space between them. So we can just make this very simple distance measure. So what we did with all the human segmentation data was we, we examined this counting process. We used a simple distance measure, which would be familiar from before when we're applying that in our um, in our first model, our network-based model, our CNN-based model, we took the interrated distance for all the pairs of people who watched the same videos. Okay, so then we end up with a distribution of our human interrated distances. Okay, so a very, very large distance would be, for example, that one of the raters had very few events uh, and, and they basically never responded. And the, for the exact same video that another rater would have lots of events and so they'd accumulate up rapidly. Okay, so we get this distribution of interrated distances. We then wanted to compare, of course, our, our EEG-based rater and our model-based rater. And so what we would do is for each of those cases, let's say the EEG rater, we would compare the EEG rater versus all the human raters. And then we could take the mean of that and then we'll look at whether the mean of all the EEG versus human rater distances was similar to the distribution of human versus human raters. So the idea here would be, well, if the, if the EEG-based rater is doing a pretty good job of producing annotations that are very human-like, then you shouldn't be able to particularly tell that it's outside of the distribution of human raters, right? It's not doing something vastly different. Okay, so here we have for a particular set of city scenes, it's a, just as a histogram here of the distances, right? So we get treating this as the null distribution. This is the inter-rated distances for our human observers. Okay, so we end up with this set of distances. And then the red line corresponds to the average of, in this case, our, our model rater, our, our neural network-based model rater. 
Okay, and so what we can then do is we can say, well, what proportion of human raters were more distant from each other than the average of our model base rater? In this case, we say, okay, well, actually, a relatively large proportion of human raters were performing, uh, were more distal from each other than the model. So reasonably, this wasn't a particularly extreme outcome. The, the model base rater was doing a reasonable job. We can look here at uh, the same scenario for the set of countryside and campus videos, and we can look here at the same scenario for office and cafe videos. And so we, of course, would use an inferential criterion here and say, well, if the average of the model rater or the EEG rater is substantially more extreme than the distribution of the human raters versus each other, then probably it's doing something a little bit different than what the human raters were. So it's not doing such a good job. Okay, so we take these and we'd say, well, that's a, that's a poor performing rater for our model or for the EEG case. And these ones, who knows if they're the same or different, but we, we, we can reasonably say that it's not doing such a poor job. Okay, so recalling that we had three types of scene, a city, a countryside, an office scene. We had 13 uh, video sets corresponding to the 13 different participants that did the EEG experiment. So we had 39 cases overall that we were considering. So based on the different scene types, the different model segmented and EEG segmented things produced extreme outcomes, outcomes that we would say probably were quite different from what the human raters were doing, only four times out of 39, each of them. You can see there's a different pattern here. So the model segmented version is doing uh, poorer on the countryside scenes and the EEG based one's doing worse on the office type scenes. But overall, um, they're doing a pretty good job. So this is fresh data that's, we haven't tweaked these things hardly at all. These are, you know, first pass um, with using these different approaches. And you can see that whatever we're doing with these, with these different models, they don't seem to be performing that dramatically differently than what our humans would do. They're providing annotations that are in roughly the same place as what the humans do. So for each approach, the segmented event set was only considered extreme in four out of 39 cases. And again, this is not particularly tweaked. It's not tuned in any, any uh, extensive way. Right, so to just quickly sum up, I, I think overall, I think it's intuitively obvious that time perception depends on content and working from that, that basic observation, we went on to say that if we could just figure out a way to track activity associated with that content and find salient events embedded in that content, that we would be able to reproduce human subjective reports. And that's what we were able to do. We were able to do a pretty good job of that with, with this DeepNet model out of the box. And then when we applied the similar principle to the human neuroimaging data, um, we were able to do the same thing again, even predicting for a given person based only on their, their neuroimaging data, what their response would be for a given trial. The salient events as we've defined them conceptually seem to map well onto the event segmentation literature um, that has evolved in episodic memory field. And it seems we've kind of come from a different direction, but converge on the same basic functional units that we're working with in each case. Um, and it might, this might appear trivial at first sight that, of course, we're just going to come up with the same units. Of course, memory and time are related in this way. We know that time is just a function of memory. You know, it's reasonable to start from this position, but I would just counter with, when I started this project six years ago as part of this EU FET thing where we were trying to produce machines, we we're trying to embed models in, in robots um, that were human-like time, that at that time, if you delved into the literature, it's still, and it still is, dominated by discussions about internal clocks, that there's some singular internal clock or the debate is, oh, is there one clock or is there many? I keep having reviewers argue with me about this and say, no one believes that anymore, Warwick. That's a ridiculous thing to say. But then I get sent another three papers to review that are all making claims about internal clocks. So <coughs> I think that compared to the, the state of the time literature, it might seem trivial now to look at it that these, that these things should converge and be the same. But I don't think that was obvious when we started out. So just a quick uh, summary of things I think are important that we still have to do. The focus here in all the examples that I've given is, is on vision 
the reason for this is, is predominantly the same reason the vision's overstudied in so many other cases that it was convenient at the time. So of course, when we started out with our initial convolutional neural network, um, that's an image-based network. So we were constrained in that way. We then continued on in this, in this vein because it was simple to do. But I, I'd like to emphasize, because lots of people bring this up, I'd like to emphasize that there's no reason that we've come across and there's no reason in anything that we've been doing that we can't extend the approach that we've used to other modalities and to combinations of modalities. And in fact, when you look at the um, episodic memory literature where they are talking about event segmentation, uh, going through deeper hierarchies than what we've been talking about with this kind of just going through vision, but you go up into frontal areas, you start talking about narrative, you start talking about auditory cortex, you can see that the convergence here uh, between these fields, it shows you that there's not gonna be a problem with doing this. There's a technical thing, like we have to actually go and do it, but there's no conceptual reason. And it's something that we are actively working on. I've had students working on various uh, instantiations of auditory um, deep networks and looking at how we might be able to make them behave well. It's something that's very interesting, but I don't think there's a, there's a fundamental issue with us doing it. It's just something that needs to be done. Um, I'd like to continue this, I gave you this very brief tour at the very end there about our work to try and match up the different uh, approaches to definitions of event, um, data-driven and model-driven approaches. And I'd, I'd like to continue, and I think we'll continue in, in the near term working very deeply on that, because I think it's fascinating to figure out basically what ways the different approaches fail. So we saw that there was a slight difference in our very first pass in terms of the models being slightly better at, at different scenes. Um, you could predict that maybe that's going to be reasonably true, that certain approaches are going to be more sensitive to certain uh, features in natural scenes and in natural experience. And I think it would be really good in the short term to get a good grasp on, on not only how those things work relative to each other, but then more deeply how and whether those events that you're getting can be mapped onto memory content, precisely what is being remembered. And those are the two things that we're going to be working on, uh, particularly in the short term, most deeply. Um, the event segmentation literature and episodic memory in general, a lot of the time they've been using uh, these heavily edited things, like I mentioned, you know, we're focusing on things like TV shows like Sherlock. And so they, they focus a lot on narrative contribution. And of course, the stuff that I've been presenting today, we focus very much on information originating in sensory regions. So we're starting kind of at the lower levels and building our way up, whereas uh, there's been this focus more on narrative um, in certain uh, parts of that field. And of course, so an essential thing we're going to have to do is, is bridge this gap and figure out uh, where things are not aligning and versus where things kind of align for free um, because the approaches are naturally matched. And of course, I mentioned this briefly in terms of people talking about more biologically reasonable models uh, in terms of artificial neural nets, these convolutional neural nets, or having recurrent neural nets for doing object classification, building more biologically causal classification models in general, there's a lot of work towards this. And so of course, it's quite trivial to spend some time updating the core of our approach to perhaps integrate more biologically reasonable models and see how much better they get. Do we get more stuff for free? We were using very rough, simple ones in the beginning. Um, is there an advantage to increasing the complexity there if you get closer to being more biologically similar? Um, and we've gone some way in doing that. I didn't mention this paper at all until now. Um, we had this work that's been led by Zaf, whoops, uh, trying to build a, a full episodic memory model, uh, wherein the time perception components are built roughly, or at least conceptually, in, in a very similar way to what I've described to you for these much simpler models that we're talking about today. I didn't bring this up because it would take about two hours to talk about this paper by itself. But very simply, we're just trying to convert the continuous neural states or the continuous states of a network into kind of statistical uh, semantic memory and then build explicit episodes out of that such that you can start to do more interesting things uh, like not only uh, get estimates of time for now, so-called prospective estimates where people are timing, their, their task is to keep track of time. That's kind of what I've been doing about so far. Um, but also to be able to estimate time based on historical episodes, so points in their life um, from episodic memory, but also then potentially to do the same for time travel. So if you can travel mentally into the future, you could then use a similar kind of approach to what we talk about in this model uh, 
um, to estimate process, to estimate time for things that haven't happened yet. Um, if you're interested in that, that paper is up on BioArchive and we talk about a lot of these things. It's quite a big paper. Um, and so we, this is all very interesting and, and hopefully we get to continue this work. I just say quickly thanks to all the people who did all this work. So thanks to Maxine and Zaf and then to Alberto. Uh, a lot of this work or a lot of the core ideas of this work uh, came out of the Timestorm project that finished a few years ago. But I think that most of the conceptualization of how we figured out all this stuff was going to work, a lot of that work was done then, and which has kind of been unfolding it subsequently. Um, so that's all from me. Hopefully that wasn't too far over time. Um, does anyone have any questions? It works. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk, thought provoking, exactly what we needed on a, on a Friday night. Um, I'll open, talk up for questions. Um, just yell your question out, please. Or type in the chat room. Um, I have a question, please. Okay. Jeff, if I may. Um, I could you say just a really interesting talk, and I'm 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 very much uh, very curious about the connection between time estimation and episodic memory because uh, of my interest in uh, temporal context models for for modeling episodic memory, of course. So, um, but could you just explain a little bit more about how you evaluate the time estimation from the event segmentation data? Because I didn't don't think I exactly got that properly. Okay, so in this case, I, I, I didn't touch in this case yet. We have the data, I, I didn't show it here. Um, in this case, we were more just concerned about whether our model, going all the way back, whether our model was like uh, our human annotator. So the events that we were getting from our time model, this model that we'd built explicitly to do time, was it producing, were the events that it was producing in order to do this, this problem of how do you do time, did they actually map onto the events that people are talking about in this other case? And so the, the conclusion here by doing this, uh, this interrated distance that we came to was, well, it seems to be doing a pretty reasonable job only in only four out of 39, which is a similar number to a model which has been developed explicitly within the event segmentation literature to do event segmentation. Our model, which was built to do time perception, the events that we're tracking seem to map onto the same kind of events. So how this then goes back to time, well, of course this model we can just apply in time however we like, in the same way as I described back in, in the first set of uh, experiments at the start of the talk. Um, this stuff that I presented here was only focusing on then whether the events that we're getting are similar to the events that other people are talking about. Okay, Brian, you've got your hand Thank up. Thank you. Yeah, I think Einstein claimed uh, that time perception depends on how much you're enjoying yourself. So if you're in some very unpleasant situation, time seems to go very slowly. Whereas if you are really enjoying yourself, time flies fast. So do you think that's true? And if so, are you able to build it into your modeling approach somehow? Yeah, so I didn't mention it at all because it goes off in a tangent, but none of those scenarios are a problem for us. Um, in principle, all you have to do is say that um, when you are attending to time, there is more time. When you are attending to things that are part of time or are indicative of time, there is more time. When you are not attending to time, when you are distracted from time, there is less time. We capture this entirely in our attention thresholds. So more or less, uh, they're, doing a, they're doing a complicated job in a very simplistic way. But this red line here that we're tracking, we can parameterize this to be very low or very high. And what you might say is that when you're attending to time, when you're actively looking for things, as I was talking about this idea of being focused only on this kind of central fixation spot, when you're looking for features that might be indicative about time, that might be equivalent to basically just saying, well, I'm going to allow anything to be indicative of time. When you're doing a very particular thing, like talking to your friends, you're not really paying attention to a whole variety of things that might be indicative of time. You're paying attention to uh, just the specific things that you're engaged with. And so I think in general, this is doing a very coarse level job of approximating a more complex thing, which is which set of features you're attending to in your experience. 
Um, and we can model that. So if you look at the, if you look at this paper, I briefly mentioned our episodic memory paper, uh, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more content about how we might do that. Sorry, skipping through slides like a lunatic. If you have a look at this one, um, there's a lot of exposition about how, how we treat attention and how it, it might play a role in, um, in producing these kinds of circumstances. So that paper looks at prospective versus retrospective time, where retrospective time is, is the case of uh, thinking about time where you haven't been tracking it. So this might correspond to the aphorism, time flies when you're having fun, right? You, you weren't considering time until after the fact. And then you're like, oh, where's all my time? Uh, this paper reflects on, on that kind of thing quite deeply. Um, Warwick, I, I have a, another question, another scenario, which I think selfishly lines with my own research. It's the effects of psychostimulant drugs like amphetamine and, and cocaine, methylphenidate and the like. And what we know about those drugs is they overestimate time intervals. So people who have taken a stimulant drug tend to overestimate time intervals. I wonder if you could just comment on that. I mean, is, is there anything yep. you model which can help us explain why that might happen? So there's two possibilities in our framework that, that can accommodate that. Um, just going back to this one. Um, again, focusing on these events and these thresholds. So there's one way that you consider it, which is that the, the, the distance is exaggerated for whatever reason. So you may be transitioning between states more rapidly or more dramatically. That might be one possible explanation, might be part of the explanation, right? Uh, the other might be, again, threshold. So if you just lower your threshold, you're going to capture more events, you can have more time. Um, so one or both of these things can accommodate those kinds of, those kinds of situations and the reverse. Um, I don't know, you know, this, <clears throat> this theory called incentive salience theory yeah. of psychostimulant drugs. Have you come across? Yeah. It's not what I'm particularly wedded to, but the basic idea is that, that drugs of abuse, like stimulant drugs, increase salience of, of neutral stimuli. And the title of your talk and what you've talked about seems to sort of tie together, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. Increase so salience is be... something that's maybe going along with the, the perception of time. Yeah. And if you wanted to take that, if you want to take that approach, um, you would you would probably lean towards having the threshold be lower. So as in everything is more salient. That's how you can get a global salience change. So the relationships between all the differences are preserved. You're just more sensitive to what the differences are. Yeah, it's really interesting. Are there any other questions from the virtual audience? One more. Eddie. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, for the talk. I, I, it's more of a clarification question. So I'm a bit confused about how each of the different hierarchies in your model and also in the brain contributes to the final uh, subjective estimate of time. So I am well, okay. if you would expand on how you do yeah, that. Yeah. So so in these in these models, we are agnostic about that. Um, in what I present here, so we the regression models in, in both cases, here we take in all four layers that we considered and we regress them against physical time. So they're all just being built into the regression model in whatever weights best accommodate uh, the estimate of physical time. Uh, and we do the same here, so the three layers, we just put into a single regression model. So in these models, we're quite agnostic about how that might work. Um, and basically saying, well, we don't know and we don't really have the, the ability to specifically uh, disentangle that because of course the other problem you have is that the features from lower levels are inherited into the higher levels right it's a hierarchy so the stuff that happens at the lower level is reflected in the activity high level so separating them out is is quite tricky in this paper if you have a look um, we do make an attempt uh, to disambiguate what would happen if we if we treat different ways differently um, I have a, a quick figure here that I can show you that might give you a taste of this. Whoops. Um, so what we have here is, is the model overall. This is the kind of big version of the model that does actually keep memories and then uses those memories to inform itself. So it's a predictive coding model. Um, what we looked at is across the, the convolutional network, this base kind of deep network that we're using as a basis for our model, we looked at the different uh, interactions of task um, and um, cognitive load, which is characterized in, in this cognitive psychology literature. And what we found 
was that the in our model that the different this kind of task by uh, cognitive load interaction that you can see here in the in the blue the the blue things here these are showing human data um, for the same video set and all this kind of thing so they've got this interaction uh, this interaction here that seems to be different depending on the scene type and what we found was that there's also this difference by layer of the model in terms of how the interaction is expressed. So this starts to hint at the idea that maybe actually, this is a very, very rapid run over something that's very complicated, so I apologize, but maybe uh, that we are capable of using some kind of decision strategy that is sensitive to which layer in the network contains the most information about time. And that perhaps for rapidly changing scenes, scenes where there's lots of information in the basic sensory component, that you can rely on relatively low level properties. But for scenes where there's very little change in the sensory component, that it's more kind of, this might be more towards the kind of narrative changes that people are getting out in episodic memory literature, that the higher levels seem to replicate this kind of behavior. So the idea here that we explore a little bit, but we don't really come to any conclusions because it, it's very complicated, it seems, um, is that different layers contain different, like different levels of usefulness. So you could build a kind of Bayesian model over the top of this that decides or that, that is aware of the, the utility of the information in a given layer and relies on it predominantly or relies on some subset. But we haven't made very much progress on that yet because it's, it's quite difficult. Oh, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Just, just one more quickie from me. I mean, everything you've talked about, Warwick, is about prospective timing. I want you to just say a little bit about retrospective timing. People are asked to estimate time after the fact. Yeah. yeah. So I touched on it just briefly here. We can go back a step here. Um, again, to this paper where we explore this much more in depth. So yes, everything today I've just been talking about prospective time, which is that you're estimating time in the moment that you're aware of the fact that you're supposed to be paying attention to time. Um, you can, of course, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Maybe the aphorism reflects that you're not paying any attention to time until after the fact. There's this classic, as I mentioned briefly before, this classic cognitive load by task interactions. This is from this block meta-analysis, but this, this interaction of people reporting it goes back maybe 30, 40 years now. And the idea is that when you are estimating time in the way that I've been describing it, when your task is to pay attention to time, when you distract people from doing it by having a high cognitive load, so high cognitive load here refers to dual task, when they have to do something else in addition to keeping track of time, they, stand, they tend to underestimate time. So they, when you're not paying attention to time, you get less time. When you're paying attention to anything else, you get less time. Whereas in retrospective timing, uh, the claim has, has long been that you get the opposite. So when you're not paying attention to time, but there's more stuff. When you reflect on it later, there's more time. So that's very interesting. What we found when we went to look at this in depth, we ran an experiment where we, we recruited 13,000 people to do this prospective retrospective timing task. So each person was in just one condition, one cell. Um, they had one trial because of course you can't do a retrospective task more than once because you become aware of the fact you're supposed to be doing time. So we've got 13,000 people to do this. What we actually found is while overall we could get this kind of pattern, and it's, sorry, again, each trial was selected from our stimulus set that we've been using for all of our other stuff. So all, these are all natural videos up to a minute long. We can replicate overall, but when you look at the scene type, actually the behavior that this classical behavior that's talked about falls apart. Um, people are doing something actually quite different. So what's really interesting about this data set um, is, and we used it for the basis of the thing I just showed you before to try and build models of, of the comprehensive thing based on memory. Um, the interesting thing is that this kind of canonical thing that people talk about in the literature, this cognitive load by task interaction, seems to be much, much, much more complicated than what people have let on. And we're the first people to try and build models that can accommodate all of it. And our model does an okay job and reveals a bunch of really interesting features of it. Um, so if you're very interested in, in these task uh, dependencies in time perception, go have a look at this paper. It's, it's quite a long read. I'm happy to talk to you about it uh, at another time, but um, yeah. I think it's really, it's really we're, we're making a lot of progress, but it's genuinely very hard to get across all of these different time experiences, very rich, let's say. Yeah. 
Well, that's absolutely um, fantastic. And thank you so much for, for, for such a, an intellectually stimulating talk. Um, thank you for inviting so, me. Yeah, so I think we'll, we'll leave it there. And again, just thank you very much. <clears throat>